too. All right. Okay, thank you everyone. I uh, gave a couple minutes. I know everybody's agile at toggling between uh, multiple meetings and, and call back in. So this time I'd like to um, do a quick roll call uh, to validate that we have everybody here uh, and so we can continue. Meeting. So uh, Chief Diggins. Here. And Ms. Bruner. Here. Uh, Ms. Magoski. Here. And Ms. Ramos. Present. And Sheriff Braun. Sheriff Braun, I thought I saw your photo pop up, but it was quick. All right, we'll come back. Uh, Sheriff, are you? Here. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Castillo, still absent. Uh, uh, Chief Ramirez. Here. Uh, Chief Warren. Here. And Chief White. Here. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Sheriff Ron, uh, do you, uh, I don't know if you were able to unmute and she, yeah, there she goes. All right, we will continue. We do have a quorum, so uh, we'll continue and move forward. So, um, we have uh, concluded our closed session, and so I have nothing to report uh, at this point to, to the public. Um, and uh, I'd like to move into our next agenda item, which is our legislative update. Uh, Reggie, if you're with us, uh, Mr. Salvador is our Chief of Legislative Affairs here for Cal OES. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, just wanted to give an update on some uh, bills that we've been tracking here related to uh, telecommunications. So uh, there's uh, two bills that had just been introduced within uh, this past month. Uh, one of them is AB 2538 by Assemblymember Robert Rebus, and that would require OES to expand the California State Warning Center to include targeted alerts for public health dangers, including smoke from wildfires. It would also require uh, OES to create uh, a state notification system that sends texts and voice messages in multiple languages to residents and farm workers based on their zip codes in order to allow them of public health dangers in their area. Uh, additionally, AB 2751 by Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia uh, was introduced. Uh, and this bill, which is called the Affordable Internet and Net Equality Act, would require the CPUC in coordination with the Department of Technology and the Department of General Services to develop and establish the Net Equality Program. Uh, additionally, uh, SB 857 by, some, by Senator Ben Way, uh, Wayso uh, would extend what the California High Cost Administrative Fund A and B programs under the CPUC uh, to January 1st of 2028. Now, the, those uh, High Cost Administrative Funds A and B are monies in each of the state's universal service funds and are pro the proceeds based upon the rates and are held in trust for the benefit of rate payers and to compensate telephone corporations for their cost of providing universal service. Uh, additionally, AB 988 by, by Assembly Member uh, Bauer Kayon uh, would require 988 centers. Uh, which are the behavioral health centers to provide uh, a person experiencing a behavioral health crisis access to a trained counselor uh, by July 16th of this year and by January 1st of 2027 provide access to a trained counselor by call, text, and chat. Uh, additionally, AB 1100 by Assemblymember Aguiar Curry would require uh, the uh, information that is collected from C from telecommunication service providers by the CPUC be broken down by each emergency or disaster and then be submitted to a, as a report to the uh, commission uh, as well as to the uh, appropriate policy committees of the legislature. Uh, additionally, AB 1565, uh, which is a committee bill by the Assembly Committee on Emergency Management chaired by Assemblymember Freddie Rodriguez, would authorize OES to investigate the feasibility of establishing uh, more than one toll-free 
800 telephone line and consider lessons learned and best practices of local governments and other states that established hotlines during the COVID pandemic and other major disasters. Uh, on the federal side, uh, for uh, telecom bills, HR 1250 by Congresswoman Doris Matsui uh, would require the FCC to report on certain activations of the Disaster Information Reporting System, or DERS, uh, and to adopt uh, specified rules related to network outage reporting. Uh, additionally, HR 1848 uh, by uh, Congressman uh, Poloni would rebuild and modernize the nation's infrastructure to expand access to broadband as well as next gen 911. Uh, additionally, HR 1859 by Congressman Adam Smith uh, would authorize the Secretary of Health and Human Services acting through the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use to award grants in order to establish an unarmed 911 response program. Uh, additionally, Senate Bill 466 which is the Kelsey Smith Act by Senator Moran, would require a mobile or internet voice service provider to disclose the location information of a device pursuant to certain requests. And then lastly, uh, Senate Bill 1175, which is the 911 Saves Act by Senator Burr, would categorize public safety telecommunicators as a protective service occupation under the standard occupational classification system. So those are some bills that we're currently tracking and uh, we'll be making these available to uh, the board members as well uh, after this meeting. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Reggie, I appreciate the update. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, do we have any questions from the public? Okay, hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Reggie. Appreciate that. And I know you're, it's a busy time for you, so looking forward to next quarter and we'll see how things uh, come together here for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, our next agenda item is uh, the California 911 uh, uh, branch report. Um, uh, Mr. Budge Curry is going to provide an update for us regarding uh, current projects, Setna, NG911 deployment, uh, and anything else that's going on in our activities. So that I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Courier. All right, thank you. And Paul, if you could check the chat window, if somebody asked a question, you can pop that bill number in there. The, the bill, the last bill number that Reggie mentioned, I didn't write that down. We're not supposed to use the chat. Uh, yeah, that's right. All right, okay. Um, so I'll give an update, and uh, like, like normal, there's going to be quite a bit of information here. So I'll be uh, uh, watching the screen as will Paul. If you have a question uh, from a board member, please feel free to, um, to interrupt me as, as I go along. This slide provides a summary of the things I'll be going over. And we're going to start out with our um, uh, statistics from 2021. You probably remember in December we gave you a projection. These are the actual numbers from 2021. And we went ahead and listed on here also the stats from 2019 and 2020. The reason you see the 2020 numbers lower is the uh, mandatory stay at home orders that were in place resulted in a drop in the number of 911 calls. And uh, what we saw in 2021 is our numbers return back to, you know, basically the same as what they were in 2019. Um, however, you're seeing wireless increasing wire lines significantly decreasing and voice over ip holding about the same in terms of, of overall call volumes and uh, just to give you an idea for context the last numbers i looked at the next largest state had about 19 million 911 calls so not only are, are we the largest system in the u.s we're significantly larger in terms of call volume than some of the other states out there. All right, um, our CPE, our call processing equipment, this is the equipment that answers 911 calls in the center. We have a master service agreement in place where PSAPs can select the uh, equipment that they want installed. You see in 2021, our numbers were down significantly. The reason for that is uh, we put, had to put a freeze on 
uh, new equipment sales because the equipment that is currently being offered does not comply with the contract. And we've talked about that um, quite a few times on these advisory boards. Um, and just to give you an overview of what we're talking about there, the, the CPE equipment that we bought has to comply with the NINA I3 standard. It's in the contract. And we've been testing and validating this in our lab. And none of the current vendors are able to meet those requirements. And so that's why we've had to suspend the sales. They, we are able to, and we have been able to identify at least minimum software requirements needed to interface with NextGen 911. It doesn't support everything in the contract, but it at least gives the ability to answer a 911 call, transfer a 911 call in the NextGen world, and also um, do the location information. And our CP vendors are, are going to each PSAP and reprogramming that equipment. Each position has to be looked at individually, and we're learning that Typically, that requires multiple visits back to the PSAP. We're trying to refine that process so that there's not so much negative impact on you having a technician in your back room multiple times and also, the, obviously, the, the increased workload on, on the CPE vendor. And so we've asked them to finish all these upgrades by July of 2022, and the CPE vendors are putting some resources in place to meet that timeline right now. They're projecting they'll be done in the fall of 2022 and we're hoping through streamlining this that we can continue to move that in this step is required in order for that your call processing equipment to be able to interface with next gen 911 and receive a phone call a couple of things that we know of today and this list is getting shorter thankfully but each of our major vendors vestas in over 300 psaps um, they're currently having a problem that when a call comes in on NextGen 911 is received on NextGen 911 and then transferred out, it's duplicating that transfer request multiple times. We call that a refer and it's generating multiple messages. So you can imagine that's not desirable. We don't want multiple versions of the same call in the network. Uh, Motorola, who produces Vesta, is working on um, trying to determine what that problem is. Uh, they've been working on this for a number of weeks. This is an item that we have to resolve before we bring any additional PSAPs online. And so we're, we're hoping Vesta um, puts the resources in place to do that. Viper is having a problem with wireline calls where the location includes an apartment number or another line of, of data in that location field. And they're not able to properly parse that and pass it on to um, CAD, Computer Aided Dispatch, which is the next system down line. Um, they've, they've got it, they're working on a fix to have that in place. We think that they'll have that resolved this month and we'll be able to move forward uh, with that particular call processing equipment. About 80 PSAPs have that, the rest of our PSAPs have a, um, a bunch of other CPE providers. So we, you know, we want to just encourage you to, to know that we've got the personnel and the funding to go full speed once we get CPE at a place where we can sell again. And we're obviously um, actively working to resolve these problems. So um, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions because this, I know this is a really important topic for the PSAPs out there. Any questions from any board members on this? Budge, I'll ask a question if nobody else does. Um, um, just to, to clarify, um, when we talk about legacy CPE, um, I, I thought I heard you say that once these these items are resolved, that people could purchase off legacy CPE. But I believe that's not accurate. That you that the intention is to move forward with the the cloud providers, or is that has that been a change? So if the legacy providers were 100% compliant with the contract, yes, we would do that. They will not be able to be 100% compliant is what we're seeing um, because they, they can't do, there's, there's three or four specific functions that we've briefed out um, to this advisory board. Um, I think the last time I briefed it out was probably six or eight months ago, but they cannot, 
determine and produce Q state position state of the actual dispatcher, which is required for NINA I3. They cannot um, do IP version six and PSAP credentialing, which is required. And there's some other down in the weeds NINA I3 stuff that the CPE can't do that the requ contract requires them to do. None of that, and it kind of gets confusing because we knew that those limitations existed. We put workarounds to shore up those gaps in our next gen 911 course, uh, course system so that we can still deliver the call. We just don't want to buy more of that old equipment that doesn't meet all the needs um, and, and if it essentially put a PSAP in a place where you got brand new equipment that doesn't do everything it's supposed to and you're stuck with it for five years. Um, so you're right, Leanne, the, the plan is and continues to be uh, this current CPE contract of legacy CPE expires in April. We're going to let it expire. The new cloud-based contract, which I'll talk to you in a couple of slides, um, is the way of where we're headed in the future. And that's the CPE that will be deploying at PSAPs in the future. And I'll give a status on that in a minute. Thank you. All right, Brenda, I see your hands up. Yes, um, kind of what Leanne was um, speaking about the legacy equipment with the Viper and updating the software. So are PSAPs um, needing to uh, contact the vendor directly for the upgrade before April, before the contract? Is that something the state is going to work on? Or how do we keep our system up and running yeah, so the state is making those contacts for you and we're, we're coordinating a schedule. Um, Andrew Matson on my team is heading that up and he knows the schedule that's been given to us by, you know, it, it could be one of several different vendors, but AT&T has the majority of the CPE support that's out there. Uh, Frontier is supporting some. And then, you know, we have some Motorola Directs, some Entrato Directs, um, and other service providers. But Andrew is coordinating all that on my team, and uh, he can give you a status of when, you know, your PSAP is scheduled. And, and keep in mind that your date is dependent on everybody before you meeting their date and not rearranging things around. And uh, that does happen quite often, but that's, that's the process we're in now. If you are an integrated text to 911 PSAP, you'll be done by the end of March is when your upgrades will be completed because we need to have those software updates in place to do the text to 911 transition. I'll cover that in, in a little bit. And then the rest of the PSAP migration schedule primarily follows um, the schedule that we've been pushing all along on uh, where we are in terms of migration. And, and like I said, Andrew has that detail. Okay, thank you. All right, Rosa, I see your hands up. Good morning, Budge, um, and everyone. Two questions, and please stop me if it's something you're gonna cover in your next update on cloud-based CPE. Uh, the first question is, does the state have a plan for when the cloud-based cloud -based CPE deployment will take place? I imagine just looking at the prior slide, I mean, you have over 100 PSAPs on legacy systems that are prior before 2016. So I'm, I'm guessing everybody's going to go huge rush to try to make a purchase. Um, so is the state prepared to handle that? What's the plan? The second question to that is, when will each PSAP know how much funding we will receive for the new cloud-based CPE purchase? Okay, so yes, I am going to address both those questions on the next couple slides and call me out if I don't. All right, um, so cloud-based CPE, we signed the contracts in December, 2020, started bringing vendors into our lab to do that test. And originally we wanted to finish NextGen 911 deployment completely before we added the extra layer of complexity of cloud CPE. That's not a good idea now, as the timeline for next gen 911 has been extended due to some of the challenges we've encountered. So we did a change to our contract working with CDT 
and we added the functionality for cloud-based CPE to interface with camera trunks, your existing 911 connections. All of that has been done. And so the way this will work is once the cloud vendor passes the lab testing, and I'll give you some stats on that on the next slide, they then have the, Andrew calls this their hunting license, they're able to go out and, and sell their equipment to PSAPs. We know you want choices, and so we're working hard um, to get as many of these vendors that you see on this slide through the testing process. So we would love to have five through by the end of May, I mean by the end of March. It will probably take us into May or June before we get five, but we'll probably have two or three available by the end of March. And I'm gonna show you a graphic on the next slide. Once you've got folks on this graphic that are green, meaning they've passed lab, the contract requires them to be able to deploy at your PSAP within 90 days of when they finish the statement of work. So the process will remain the same as it is today. We have some PSAPs out there that are in years six, seven, and eight for maintenance. We want to let them go first. Um, there's a, a new PSAP down in uh, Desert Hot Springs. Um, that's forming. They're, they're going to go first because they're on a, a tight timeline. They have no CPE at all. And then from there, Janae, um, who is on the, this call, she's the supervisor that manages your PSAP advisor. She'll work with those other PSAPs on a priority basis so we get those that are critical through first. We probably can get about 100 done in a year, provided we have the CPE um, through lab that you like. All right, so that first year is going to be busy for her. We've got the staffing in place. We have the process defined. We've done almost 100 in a previous year where they were on-prem solutions and they were much, much more difficult uh, in terms of complexity to install. So we think we can do 100. And the first few may take a little longer than 90 days as they figure out some of the details. But that would be our hope, Rosa, is that once you select a vendor within 90 days, that solution's in your, in your PSAP and you're validating that it meets your needs. So did that answer all your questions? Mine is the financial piece, but um, I have another question, if you don't mind me. Yes, yeah, so the, the financial piece, you'll know when you reach out to Janae, it's based on your call volume and um, it'll be very similar to your last allotment, very similar. I, there's not gonna be significant changes because the pricing didn't change significantly. So, uh, but, but you'll work with Janae and your, your PSAP advisor um, to go through those details once you submit to us a request, just like you, know, you, you have in the past. Thank you. My, my other question, Budge, is I'm looking at some, your product list here, um, and I've never seen the Rapid Deploy product, the Omni 911 Cloud. What's the plan for giving PSAPs the opportunity to see these products? So, two-pronged two approach. We've been very careful not to let the vendors contact you before they pass the lab because we don't want you to be bombarded by a bunch of uh, CPE vendors who may never make it through the process. Um, so we, we, we are not letting them talk to you on purpose yet. Um, so once they get through the lab and they're green, then we'll let you know who those are that have passed. And you've got a couple of opportunities. You can come up to the lab and see it in person, no problem. You can schedule with Janae and we can give you a, a drive test of it remotely. A little harder for you to interact with it remote, but if you can't get travel for some reason, then we can facilitate that. And then I think the other opportunity where you could do this directly is next week at Calnina because these vendors will all be there and you'll be able to see at least their demo. Um, now at that point, they may not be through the lab yet and you can't make a purchasing decision. So if you fall in love with one and they can't get through lab until August or September, then you just have to wait till then to buy it. All right, so 
this graphic we used last time and we thought it would be helpful because this doesn't really tell you well, how much farther do they have to go. So we came up with this graphic. And for any vendors that are on this watching the presentation, if you think I put your box in the wrong spot, let me know and I'll send an update. But this is as of Friday, what we were told by our testing team. So every box on here correlates to a, a step in the process. And the green box at the end is, is the magic box, right? That's, that's when we certified it and they're ready to sell. So you can see we work through this. They first have to establish a VPN connectivity. Um, they configure URIs. A URI stands for a Uniform Resource um, Identifier. It's, it's like a domain name. It's just the way that you communicate in NextGen. And they start doing testing. We give them test numbers. And they're able to actually place calls into NextGen core services. And the vendor will receive them back at their interface in the cloud to see if all the connectivity is working. Um, and so Carbine is at that step right there. And I, by reading through the data, I don't know if they've finished that hurdle and they're, they're on the next one or if they're still at that one. It, it was a little unclear to me from the data. So Carbine, if you're listening and I have you one box behind where you should be, my apologies. The next, once they validated, they can exchange calls back and forth with core services. Okay, then they start what we call phase one and they go through phase one testing with us to validate that they actually can interface with the core service and do basic functionality. Uh, we validate that and then they then that we order the circuits to connect them to both of the core services. And some of this is a little technical, I understand. So if you're not tracking, that's, it's okay. But basically any vendor in California needs to be able to receive and route, receive routed calls from the region provider and receive routed calls from Atos. So you have to connect and test with both core services to make sure that you can interact with their bridge software and all the other details are in there. Omni 911 and Motorola Cloud are in that process right now. Once you get through that, then you actually sit down with Cal OES after you validated, you can go through all the test cases and there are literally dozens and dozens of test cases that we, we put them through. Um, everything from voice calls, text calls, RTT, video calls, transfers, abandons, no answers, overflow, you know, all that gets tested. Autos has a product called Gemma and NGA is a product, uh, call handling solution. They're in that testing where they've come to us and said, we're ready. We've ran them through the scripts. There's a couple of things they're working on. I expect those two to finish out their work by the end of this month, maybe mid-March-ish. And so those are the two that I think will be, you know, certainly in March we'll, we'll make an announcement. Um, the other three on this graphic certainly could also meet that pace depending on how things go with them. So that's kind of where we are with Cloud CPE in more of a visual representation to give you an idea of some of the complexity here. So any other questions on that? Because this is kind of a new graphic and we want to see what you think about it. All right. And then any vendor who's just initially contacted us or given us a business card and got a contract or whatever, they're in that white box. They, they've yet to start through this process. Okay, switching gears to text to 911, this graphic has remained unchanged. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. So Sharice did a fantastic job getting us full statewide deployment. Really excited about that. And then we told her, hey, guess what? Let's do it again in NextGen. So let's see where we are with NextGen 911. Anybody who's got ComTech over the top will be transitioned to rapid deploy. We've started that transition. Uh, we started that transition on February 16th, and at, by the end of this week, we'll have 15 PSAPs transitioned. Um, next week, we're going to do something like five a day, and so this number is going to grow quite quickly. Um, and Sharice and Janae are leading this effort. They're testing right now. There's, there's four more that are going live today. 
any questions on over the top because I'm going to transition to integrated. I want to make sure everybody's tracking what we're doing there. If you are going to be going live by the end of April, you will get a message from Sharice this week um, telling you that schedule. And everybody will be finished by the end of June. Okay, integrated. We wanted to begin in March. Ran into a little problem with the testing with Vesta 7.8 and Viper. Uh, it was Vesta 7.8 in the field. They're working on solving those problems. So we're going to begin the integrated transition on April 4th. That gives us another month to work through these challenges. Um, your CPE will have to be upgraded to 7.8 if you're on Vesta, and it has to be upgraded to Viper if you're on uh, with the proper, and they call them KB levels. It has to do with the settings that are internal to Viper. Uh, and those will start in April, and there's, I think there's 302, I can go to the previous slide. There's 302 over the top, and then 134 that are integrated. And so all 134 integrated will start in April and we'll, we're, uh, we'll be finished by June. So by June 30th, we'll be completely transitioned over uh, from the old text contracts to next gen 911. Been a long time coming, but we're getting there. Sharice is doing a fantastic job and, and her and Janae have been doing a lot of testing. And we really appreciate all the support from the PSAPs as well, because we've had to We've had to do a lot of work at individual PSAPs to make this happen. So any questions on text? All right, next gen 911. This is our schedule. Um, I briefed this out last time. We're live in Tuolumne County um, with direct calls into Tuolumne County Sheriff, ability to transfer to CHP Merced, Cal Fire San Andreas and Sonora PD. Um, and that has been active since November 17th, I think it is. And um, we have had 100% system availability. There have been some call routing things that we had to address, adjust to, uh, but the system is performing just like we expected it to. And additional carriers are gonna be brought on on March 8th and, Mar March, 8th and March 15th. We wanted to do them in February, and the reason why we couldn't was that uh, Viper parsing issue that I told you about. Um, we have to get the Viper software able to parse the location data properly. So we're ready to go. Uh, we'll be moving uh, Frontier, I think is what we're migrating into Sonora PD, I believe it is, on March 8th, and then Verizon Wireless will happen on March 15th. In the southern portion of our state, Imperial County is scheduled to go live in March. We've got to get through the VESTA multiple refer issue before we can go live there. So we're, we're trying to push that issue. Um, and then similarly up in El Dorado County in the middle of our state, uh, go live scheduled for March 16th, pending that multiple refer uh, issue. All right, and these two are, are wireless. Um, which is why the, the, the uh, Viper issue doesn't come into play there because it's wireless calls that extra uh, field is not populated. And then we anticipate moving through the rest of the state on the dates that you see there with the goal to try and finish by December, but given the way this project's gone, I'm pretty sure we're gonna go into 2023 a little bit. So that's where we are. Um, in, any question on on our process or progress? If you're wondering when you will cut, when you're gonna go live, until we get these dates solid, we can't advertise solid dates for the rest of the schedule. As much as we want to, we, we just can't. So once we get confirmation that there's no remaining barriers, we'll get a definite schedule, we'll get it out to you. Um, if you want to know where you are in terms of deployment, this dashboard is still active. I took this screenshot this morning. You can see we're doing really well. We're, um, you know, above 90% for both um, Atos and region for equipment installs. 
the, the reason why they aren't at 100, there's, I don't know, 20 or so PSAPs that are moving or they've got construction going on or there's, there's some significant blocker um, that we have to solve. Um, and then you see that middle bar um, where the, um, that's the uh, CPE upgrade. You see we're working through that. And then we actually validate we can land calls once the CPE is upgraded. And then that 1% will really, that's the ticker of how many PSAPs are actually alive. And so that'll, that'll start climbing um, in March. So this is a live tool. It's not password protected, it's public data. So if you want to see where you are, you can filter for your PSAP and get a status of where you're at. And our uh, GIS team did this. They did a fantastic job with this dashboard. All right, any questions on, on that? Okay. Couple more slides and I'll be done. I know you're probably tired of hearing me talk. Um, wanted to give you and, and all the vendors out there a heads up on a couple of procurements that we're running right now. Our data analytics platform, so for California, this is ECATS. This is what we're using for statewide management information system software to get statewide stats on call volumes and transfers and everything that we do, uh, wireless routing, all that's wrapped into this. There's a, a link there and the pre-solicitation is out on uh, Cal e Procure. The way that works is it's 80-90% of what we think the final version of the RFP will be. We put it out there, we gather your comments, we've got a comment page, um, you submit those back and we need those by March 21st. We will take all those comments, meet confidentially with the bidders in the end of March, update the solicitation, push it back out in April, go into final negotiations and sign contracts by June. That same timeline applies to data sharing, but data sharing is a different project. Data analytics is your the, the third party validation we use for statistics of the network. Data sharing, I've got a graphic on that, but again, here's the link to get to the RFP, very similar timelines, but this one's a little more complicated. So before I get into data sharing, I wanna see if there's any questions on data analytics and what that is. Let's talk data sharing. So the idea is that today your PSAP has call processing equipment. We've talked about that today. And then it pushes location information over to CAD, computer aided dispatch. And that's what you're using to dispatch your resources and you interface with your emergency responders or whomever. And if you want to share data from one PSAP to another, Pretty much the only way you can do that today is via a phone call or some other manual process. And there's a better way to share data. And we want to facilitate a better mechanism leveraging NextGen 911 and these IP connections that we have. So we came up with this concept of data sharing and it has two pieces. The first piece is a portal. Think of this as a way to view the information. If your equipment at your PSAP can't integrate it directly, we, we would prefer you to just integrate it directly. But if you can't, we didn't want you to not have access to the data. So that's the data portal. And today's PSAP, that is things like Rapid SOS, Rapid Deploy, maybe you're using Rave or some other platform to look at 911 type data above and beyond what you can see in CPE and CAT. That's the data portal. Now there's got to be a way to gather that data in to the system. We're calling that data conveyance. It's how you move data from one place to another. It would pull data via either a NINA I3 standard interface, EIDO emergency, information data object or um, some other I3 mechanism or an API, which is just a, a, a programming interface where you could push this API to CAD, CAD sends it to data in those mapped fields and then it'll pull it back up into the system and share it with other PSAPs 
based on permissions that you define at the PSAP level, and that permission process is granted through the system. It also would have the ability to pull in information from the NextGen 911 system, from cloud CPE, or supplemental data that might be out there. And it's all shared based on permissions that you have, whether it's CGIS or CLETS or neighboring agency, or I want them to view my resources but not be able to modify them, or I've got auto aid, mutual aid with them, and I actually want them to be able to modify resources. All that is baked into the system. We've got the RFP out there, and um, we're going to work through this process to get this in place so we don't have you as a PSAP in a place where you say, I want that data, but I don't have the right portal to see that data, so now I can't get that data. Uh, <clears throat> we want to remove that barrier. So a fairly um, interesting concept and initiative, definitely uh, a lot of challenging steps to go through, but we're hoping that you'll give us some feedback and, and input on this. So I'll pause there for your, for your questions. All right, we're going to have a, a time down at Calnita to talk through this. So anybody who's interested in joining us in kind of an after-hours session to talk through this, let us know, and we'll loop you in. And if you have comments um, about the solicitation, they're due. And um, there, I see Leanne's hands up. Go ahead, Leanne. I was trying to actually use the feature instead of jumping in front of everybody like I normally do. See, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, I had some thoughts about this from seeing it from the long range planning committee. And so I wanted to ask a question that may spur some conversation. Um, with the data conveyance piece, um, you know, yesterday we said, basically what I heard you say is if we can, you can set this up for your CAD to communicate with, I'm looking at Rosa with Alameda County's CAD, um, that's great. You can use the data conveyance. So basically we're going to use the ESI net instead of the agencies that are currently using CAD to CAD that have to pay for a network. The network's going to be basically um, not a cost that agencies are going to have to worry about anymore. Is that accurate? That is definitely accurate. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So see, I, I learned something from yesterday. Um, but the but they would distill that um, part from my central square CAD to a hexagon CAD those APIs with our specific vendors would still be the responsibility of the individual PSAP or agency that, that they would take care of those on their own. It's just really the data conveyance is that network that you can run it across. Yes. And the question that was asked of us yesterday at the long range planning committee was, um, you know, what are you going to do if PSAP comes to uh, the state and says, Hey, we really want to do this, but our CAD vendor wants to charge us X dollars to do that. We can look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. It is an allowable expense under Setna, provided it isn't so big that we don't have the budgetary authority to do it. But we wouldn't want to do it for every single PSAP. We would want to work vendor by vendor to say, look, if we develop this or we, you know, we provide this functionality in Monterey County and Central Square in X County, you give it to them too. Don't come to don't come back to us saying you've got to redevelop this API that you've already written. Something like that we might be able to have a conversation on, but yes, once it gets into this data conveyance space, the state will, with the permissions you establish, move the data around to wherever you want it moved. That's the idea. Yep. Okay, All right. Thank yeah, thanks. Chief White, I see your hands up. Yes, uh, thanks for sharing this. And I know you guys have been supportive of bringing this to the uh, Clets Advisory Committee. Um, what is the timeline when you would be open to looking at transporting this data across using the data conveyance side? There's an implementation timeline in the SOW that admittedly is quite aggressive. I'm waiting to see the feedback I get on it. Um, but we would sign contracts and start work in July. And then they would, the vendor would give us a, uh, they have, I think, 90 days to give us a project deployment plan. And then we would work to build the interfaces in our lab over the next, uh, in the first 180 days, so the first six months of the contract. So that takes us all the way through into 2023. 
And then from there, we would look to see where we're at, if we could then support initial deployments at PSAPs that are at that point. So this is this time next year before we're even anywhere close to being at a place where we say, okay, this system's up, it's tested, it's vetted, and we have a couple integrations with CAD vendors. We will look to purchase a couple of positions of CAD in our lab to facilitate that interface so that we don't bug the PSAP. But at some point, we'll need to have somebody who's willing to uh, work with us on uh, early deployment of this, and that would be a little over a year from now. Thank you. And that's prior to any feedback we've received from vendors. So they may look at this and say, well, wait a minute, this is a budge timeline. You, you got to make some adjustments here. <laughs> All right, Rosa. This data sharing services portal, is this in lieu of a shared cloud CPE CAD to CAD type of thing? Yes, because if, if for CPE, Calls can be transferred one from another. We've, we've baked that into the system. Once you have cloud CPE, we wrote the requirement in that contract that they have to be able to interface with an API that, that we defined. So if you've got cloud CPE, you wouldn't need the portal at all because anything in the portal, hypothetically, we'd have to work on this, but it's supposed to be available in the cloud CPE. Yes, but if you don't have cloud and you don't have a newer CAD and you're looking for somewhere to share the data, this is it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. More to come on this and uh, appreciate your feedback. And if you don't have time to go read the RFPs or the solicitations, just send in your comments direct. And if we've already addressed that in the technical requirements, then we'll, we'll know we've taken the action you need. So in other words, don't let time be the barrier to you submitting feedback. We absolutely want your feedback. Okay, um, this slide is about PS Alley. We had it in the last advisory board. I'm not gonna brief it. If you have any PS Alley customers in your county or in your dispatch area, Please push this information to them so we can establish a process for them to continue to receive their updates in uh, NextGen 911. The last couple of slides have not changed. We're nearing the end of our budget year. I can tell you we're very healthy in terms of our fund. Uh, we have the revenue we need, we have the appropriations we need, and we're able to pay all the invoices, uh, which is really good news for us. We did set our fee uh, for calendar year 2023 at 30 cents, which is the same as it was last year. And our uh, predictive models show that that's going to bring in the revenue that we need to do everything we just talked about. Um, so we're in really good shape. And that's really thanks to the members of this board and the hard work that you did a couple years ago uh, to get this funding model in place. And we really appreciate it. It's proven to be very successful. All right, Rosa, your hands up still, are you? Um, just something that I see in your slide, looks like you have your formula built into um, your picture there, just FYI. Yeah, I put that in there so that um, people would see how I'm doing my calculation. Okay, all we, right. We got a lot of questions on how did you get that number? And so we just went ahead and put it right in there um, so that people could see how we did our calculation. I know it looks a little funky. If you're an Excel geek, though, you're going to be like, oh, I like that. <laughs> OK. Um, and, and that's it for my brief. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that was long. It, it was, was, but it was uh, very, detail. very thorough, but so thank you very much. Uh, and and a good report. Um, do we have any? Uh, I know that there was a lot of information covered there. So if there's any other alibis from the uh, from the board. Hearing none, do we have any questions from the public for Mr. Kerr? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to next agenda item, which is the long range planning uh, committee report. And our chair is going to provide information regarding the long uh, range uh, planning committee meeting. 
and uh, Next Gen 911 uh, Task Force activities. Actually, uh, Chris Heron, the chair, cannot make it, so I was appointed to uh, brief out on the Long Range Planning Committee. So, okay, thank you, Leanne. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, go ahead. We, um, the Long Range Planning Committee, had some very detailed discussions, obviously, on the data sharing system that um, Budge just reviewed. So that's why um, I had some follow up questions. Um, and, you know, it, it's definitely something that we, um, it's a long time coming, and there are some um, benefits, but. Um, we also have a lot of questions about the um, the portal piece, and so that was uh, fleshed out. So hopefully, um, some people can provide some details on that RFP. We also discussed the data analytics RFP, which is our current provider of eCats, and encouraged um, users of the system to go ahead and provide high level input to make sure that um, um, this RFP meets our needs in the piece. Um, both of those took um, that data sharing took quite a long time. We also discussed the 988 technology requirements, and we discussed some operational um, early um, items about 988 technology. Um, um, and and there's a lots of questions, and we're we're working um, through the Nina Working Group for some best practice standards, and then the state is working on getting the obviously the budget change proposal to um, get the technology up and rolling. Um, one of the things that um, the board spent some or the the committee spent some time on was the recruiting and retention development study that um, we have asked um, to have looked at. While um, technology is moving with next generation 911 and data sharing, that's great, but we also need to make sure that we have dispatchers um, in the centers to be able to manage that information. So um, we are looking at doing a study to help, but before we can do that, we need to determine functional requirements and the purpose and what the outcome of the study would be. So. Um, the Long Range Planning Committee is going to be um, putting that together and we're going to have one of our special um, LRPC meetings on April 19th to discuss those studies and how to move forward. Um, since we have this larger um, um, group here, it's very important that when we roll out this study that all PSAPs um, really participate because this study is to help staff each and every one of our PSAPs. Um, and then the regional working groups um, reported out. Um, they all had in-person meetings, and I believe the meetings um, were uh, very well attended and detailed, so it was good to see that um, come back around. And um, that took about two and a half hours of our time, and that's the report. Uh, it's all great stuff. I'm looking forward to that as you develop those requirements, and, and then obviously the study will either validate the anecdotal uh, information that we're hearing or uh, confirm, and so this is huge. And so uh, it's a great uh, step to you know address this methodically and deliberately um, so that we can uh, move forward on that initiative so thank you um, and i appreciate all the efforts on the long range planning committee side uh, for that uh, do we have any other questions from the board or uh, future items that we wish the the planning committee to add uh, to um, to look into Okay. Do we have any questions? Wait, from, I'm Chief, sorry. Chief White. Go ahead, Chief. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm not sure the timing on this, but um, I was contacted by some agencies at the California Police Chiefs uh, Training Symposium, sort of talking about the challenges with retention and looking at alternatives to cover shifts and working with other agencies. I'm not sure to add more complexity, but maybe down the road it might be good to sort of review what options exist out there, maybe with Next Gen 911 in terms of you know one agency covering another. Obviously, a lot has changed from the old days of flipping the switches or will change when it goes in. So just a FYI. No, I think it's a, it's a great point. And uh, obviously, with technology changes uh, for call answering, uh, opportunities to leverage uh, so much other uh, 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 interaction and interface between uh, neighboring uh, public safety answering points and how um, they want to do business uh, really it's a game changer for us, so I think it's it's great, and it's going to require some uh, 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 open minds to consider, you know, opportunities that uh, will exist out there. So, thank you. Um, any questions from the public? All right. Thank you. Uh, next uh, action item is appointments to the Long Range uh, Planning Committee. Um, so 
we're here to review uh, current appointments to the LRPC and appoint any new members and a new chair as necessary. Um, and so the board has been provided a current list of the LRPC members. And so I guess the question is, is there any discussion from the board uh, regarding uh, this? I believe um, what the LRPC still could have a representative from the state sheriff's association. And so we would encourage a representative to be added to the board if one became available. Okay. Committee, keep saying board. <laughs> and we do, at this point in time, we just still do not have a, a state sheriff's uh, representative. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm getting a vertical head nod here next to me. So uh, thank you. All right. We'll open that and we'll continue to work that uh, piece. Um, all right. Uh, and, uh, Chief White, your hand's still up on my screen anyway. I just want to make sure you didn't have a comment. Okay, it's down. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. Well, so I believe from the last meeting, Sheriff Braun was going to take back to CSSA mm -hmm. and discuss um, getting a sheriff's representative on LRPC. She may have had to step away because I don't. Do you see her on? I do not. Yeah, I think she had to step away. <clears throat> so we'll add that on the follow up list. And we'll follow up with uh, Chief, uh, or excuse me, Sheriff Braun. So, all right. Uh, moving next to uh, agenda item, which is uh, next generation 911 alert and warning. Uh, the 911 branch is going to provide uh, an update on NG 911 alert and warning system, uh, the migration plan, and the use of uh, NG 911 uh, alert and warning system. So, so uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this over the last few months. Um, Cal OES hosts what what are called mutual aid. Uh, region planning committees um, and those committees meet. We've talked about this in those forums. Um, our prime vendor, Autos, that is our statewide vendor, they had a subcontractor identified for this work. We started down that path and looking at the technical requirements, the complexity, the needs of the state, um, the statement of work and the technical requirements. They petitioned the state and asked if, if we would be willing to allow them to change their subcontractor out uh, to rave mobile safety. Uh, we did an analysis of that solution and we did approve that transition. So what that means is the work that any alerting authority or PSAP or sheriff or anybody out there that's been working with um, on my team, Michael Elder is the project manager for this. Uh, if you wanna reach out to Earl Cook, he's the project manager at Autos that is coordinating this. Um, for those that will be at Calnina, Rave will be there, um, and they're, they're going to be available to um, talk to you directly, uh, working with Autos, and we will begin the transition of uh, alerting authorities to whatever you're using locally. Uh, this is not an existing state contract that you're on. It will be some local contract to this solution beginning in March. Uh, believe it or not, um, they, they want to move quickly. And um, we did contact the state of Iowa, who is using them uh, as a statewide solution. I also talked to New Orleans, and those of you who have ever been familiar with New Orleans, they certainly have their share of disasters. Um, and so we did vet this solution through those different partners as well as others. And that's where we are. Details are gonna follow literally this news was shared with us um, not long ago and we were able to make it public as of yesterday, which is why we don't have a migration plan in front of you today. Uh, but we are working toward this. We know fire season's coming. Um, Michael Elder has a list of those agencies that are really um, in desperate need of this kind of solution. And again, uh, Earl Cook is the main point of contact at Autos that'll be rolling this out. There's no requirement on a local agency making this transition, um, but but we're hoping that this solution is robust enough that it meets your needs and that you'll be able to leverage all the data that's available in NextGen 911 to do your alerting. 
So that's a quick snapshot of an update, and I'll pause there for questions. Chief White. So um, just to be clear, then, Everbridge is no longer the, the sub? That is correct, yes. OK. Um, so I mean, I guess I would just revoice the concerns before. I'd look forward to a discussion on how migration will work, because they've indicated that for the Nixle customers at most of them, they own the data. So I'm not sure how we're going to get the data out. Um, so certainly a, a barrier for some agencies trying to migrate. Um, the other question would be, you have in there the use of the, the next gen 911 and alert and warning. One question that um, some agencies have asked as far as migrating is, you know, currently we use it for a lot of stuff, not just necessarily emergencies. Have, has the state discussed what limitations would exist on usage of this system? Yes, in excruciating detail. So okay. um, WIA and IPAWS, so that's wireless emergency right. alerts and IPAWS, which is, includes the emergency um, alerting a system available through broadcaster. That's all included. Public safety messaging, all included across all platforms, voice, text, um, email, all, all the ways that you want to send messages. Local alerts, you know, hey, we're having a meeting here. What about this? What about that? That is supported unlimited, but not in text message because text message requirements changed at the FCC level um, and there's a limit on how many text sessions you can send but all other formats unlimited and included with the solution um, and there's a lot more detail buried behind that but we did ask that question and um, you know we we, uh, we really worked through that one in a lot of detail thank you uh leanne your hands up um so so two quick questions well, probably not quick questions but um so if you were on everbridge on the state version of everbridge there is no because there's a, it's a subcontractor there is there any transition time or is it going to be expected to you know flip a switch to rave and and you 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 go live there will be no overlap so the overlap should be minimal. Um, I, I can't comment on what Atos is doing with their subcontractor relationship, but from the state's perspective, you know, we pay Atos, and so uh, Atos is who our service is with. Um, the details of the transition, Leanne, let's link up with Earl Cook, and he can walk you through that. Okay, and then um, just one other question because um, to Chief White's point, this whole Nixle thing is was, was creating a lot of consternation with, with local agencies. And I hear you say that RAVE has local alerts, but it will not support text messaging or we would have to sign an additional contract with them to pay for those messages. So there's, a, there's probably about a 15 minute explanation behind that. And I'm okay. not gonna answer that question right now because it will be taken out of context and I, I want to be careful. Okay. But local alerting is supported in the platform in a variety of different ways. And there are good reasons why you don't want to use text messaging for that purpose. I, um, it, it would be a helpful in the future, maybe not a, you know, advisory board meeting, but to educate because obviously, um, our local OES offices, have a have a great understanding of wanting to use text messaging to um, communicate with the public and obviously there are more details now and consequences to using it so i think there needs to be a bit of a paradigm shift with how we communicate with the public so completely understand that appreciate that the state is offering um alert and warning at no cost but you know all these little pieces are the devil's in the details yep and we'll get into the details in separate meeting um as, as we move into the transition. But yes, the capability is there in the system and it's not separated out, which um, was, was a challenge before. Thank you. Yeah, probably the biggest barrier is the one that Chief White mentioned. If you have local data and you can't extract it from your system, that, that, that data extraction is under a contract we the state don't manage. 
If you can get the data, we absolutely will push it up into the system. We have that ability and that is an absolute requirement. So if you can get the data, we can use it. Uh, let's see, Chief Ramirez. I just want to reiterate the same concerns that I've heard here that the transition, we're going to lose users in the transition. And if there's any way to work through that process that we don't, uh, so many of the local jurisdictions, and, and I imagine this is statewide, have worked really diligently to have uh, those contacts placed in the system. And it's gained credibility now to where people can rely on it. And I'm afraid that that will be diminished in this transition. Yeah, uh, thanks Chief Ramirez. So that is one of the main things we talked about was the messaging plan. And just so that you think we're not throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater, even in the other transition, there was still going to be this need to sort of re-sign up, um, even if you were an existing user. So. The, the transition is very similar, regardless of which subcontractor was chosen. And we've been working with Autos to, to tell them that, look, your messaging plan is going to be critical as you get the word out on this. Budge, I had a quick follow-up, actually two follow-up questions. Um, under the new agreement, is the state going to own the data so we don't run down this path again? Because obviously technology will change and at some point there might be some other new technology. I, I know the data is owned by us, but you know, it's, it's your data. It's not the vendor's data. So you won't run into this problem in the future. We absolutely wrote that in as a requirement. And the second thing is you mentioned about um, a lot of discussions with the we, is there any it seems like there's obviously significant statewide concern. Um, is there like a smaller working group um, that's dealing with these or raising the questions? I know a lot of agencies, I think you're hearing it, have spent a lot of effort here and to make sure that their experiences don't get lost and that we do it sort of seamlessly for those who choose to join. Yes, we have several different opportunities for you to interact with other alerting authorities in the state. There's the SEMS, the State Emergency Management System User Group, and the Technical Subcommittee of that group, and they address this issue from a policy and best practices perspective. And then we formed a user group to focus on the technology and the transition. Michael Elder is leading that effort up with Earl Cook from Autos. So if you want to talk technology, transition, migration plan, it's Earl and Michael. If you want to talk best practices, operational use, um, and, and, and guiding that policy, let us know. We'll link you up with the SEMS um, technical uh, subgroup that's addressing alert and warning. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Budge. Um, and we'll continue to monitor this issue and we'll, we'll keep it uh, on the agenda as we work through uh, this section item. Okay, uh, next uh, action for us is the agenda items for future meetings. Um, with that, I know that the next scheduled 911 advisory board meeting is uh, scheduled for May 18th. Um, that will be an in-person meeting, so you'll need to plan for your travel accordingly uh, on that. I know that, uh, please check your calendars because I think uh, uh, Sophia has already sent out all of your uh, invites to you. So if you'll just uh, confirm your attendance and, and so we can uh, plan accordingly on our end. And then um, as we look towards this upcoming meeting in May, I guess I would ask again, what additional topics that you'd like to hear on that meeting? Uh, we've already talked about 988, so we're going to add that. Uh, into the uh, next meeting and we'll provide uh, an update then uh, for that and then uh, any other uh, items that we wish to um, look at or uh, go over in detail. I think it might be good to add alert and warning as a separate item to hear about that transition that, that may be taking place between now and our next meeting. You got it. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, anyone else? Well, 
Okay. Um, if you think of something after the close of this uh, meeting, just uh, send that information to Paul and we'll uh, push it out and we will uh, look to add that on uh, as an action item uh, for us. Um, we do have um, other uh, agendas and items. You know, we have the uh, conference here in California for, for Nina. We have uh, Next Gen 911 uh, goes to Washington, some initiatives on the federal side. So some things may come out of that and if those come together, um, we'll look to um, add those to uh, the next uh, agenda meeting uh, for us and, and bring those to the board's attention. Uh, with that, I know I've opened it up a few times for public comment, but uh, on different items. Uh, Paul, is there any uh, uh, requests for public comment uh, that we have? I am not seeing any hands raised in the window. We did have one chat that came through from uh, Michael DiPredo. Uh, Michael, can you uh, please voice your question? Uh, Michael, if you can uh, hear us, uh, I don't know if you're on mute, but I uh, would love to hear what your uh, question or comment is. Uh, the question that was sent in the chat was how would the public be transitioned from our alert and warning page for signing up and wouldn't they have to sign back up to make changes to their data uh, i understand if this is still being worked out uh, this is in regards to sure, the migration. Yeah. yeah that'll be um, addressed in the public messaging that autos works on with rave in the migration plan about how that messaging is done uh, we did talk through that kind of at a high level at what that would look like. So we are addressing that and um, those details will be shared as we begin to roll out alerting authorities and after we gather more information from locals on what their needs are locally. So that is definitely part of the work that Michael and Earl are going to be doing. Okay. Any other uh, public comment? I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you to the membership uh, for your time and those that uh, are observing the meeting. Richard Ray has his hand up. Just saw it come up. Uh, Mr. Ray. We, we can see you, Richard. I don't know if you're bringing on your interpreter. Yes, yes. Hello there. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm assuming you hear me. Uh, thank you for allowing me just to briefly uh, comment here to the board. Um, so this is uh, what I wanted to say. Here in the deaf community, hard of hearing community, the deaf blind community, we don't have full access to uh, all the information. So I'd like request uh, for consideration to be more inclusive uh, for people uh, with those disabilities, um, as well as deaf, uh, hard of hearing, uh, or deaf blind, to have full access um, that where all information is being sent out uh, to make sure that it's inclusive um, and that we make sure that we have a resolution uh, to make that uh, fully inclusive and accessible um, and also just to make sure that everyone is included in that process uh, for those people um, who also don't speak English, you know, or don't have the technology available. Um, we want to make sure to request that consideration. Um, and I've already sent in um, my uh, document um, for the CVAA and the ADA um, to uh, Sophia um, Munoz. And I shared with the board uh, with our perspective on how we would approach that, of uh, the many challenges that come with that, with having uh, accessibility to the E911 system and also information that is sent out. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're sharing with that, um, with the whole Department of Finance and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as the other federal agencies um, for, those, for their consideration. Um, but I really appreciate your time and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your comments, and uh, and I appreciate you sending that stuff to Sophia. And we'll take a look at that, uh, and then uh, respond accordingly. So thank you. 
Okay. Uh, this takes us into the last item on the item uh, on our board meeting here, which is adjournment. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Leanne. Rosa will second. Okay, thank you, uh, Rosa. Uh, the meeting is now closed. Uh, today is the February 23rd, Wednesday at 11.53. Thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to seeing you uh, next quarter uh, in May. Thank you.